Hey boys and girls, Ken Smith and Buddy the Wonder Dog here at uh, KenSmithFishing.com. This is going to be video number four of the Todd Driscoll video series. If you have not seen videos one, two, and three, and you're watching this on YouTube, how do I do that? That eye right there will take you to the first video in this series. Uh, this particular, so Todd sat down with us and just went through a whole bunch of really interesting information. This particular video, we're going to talk about um, electroshocking, where they do it, when they do it, why they do it. Uh, he's going to give us kind of their shocking numbers from Talia and Rayburn, really interesting stuff. I think you'll really enjoy this video. At the end of this video, he's going to talk about um, a study they're going to do starting this fall, a two-year study on Toledo Bend, and you just got to hear about this. This is going to be really interesting because this isn't just going to be about, well, you'll see, it's going to teach us where fish go. So I'm really interested to see that result of that study. So before we jump to the footage, I want to say thank you to a couple of folks or to basically to all you guys. So I get a ton of good feedback uh, and guys will sometimes say, hey, this is not working. I don't mean to criticize you. Guys, you are not criticizing me. If something's not working, tell me. So I've had a couple of guys reach out uh, that my audio has not been great and I continue to try to make it better. I think I am getting where I need to be. Uh, the audio on this video should be good. Um, so do me this favor if you would. If you are having audio troubles on any of the videos, this one forward, if you would, post in the comments that you had audio trouble. And if you would, tell me what device you're listening on. That helps me a little bit figure out if it's a device specific issue or if it's an issue with me or exactly, I'm trying to diagnose what's going on. So if you would, if you have audio troubles, let me know. If you're not having audio troubles, it'd be nice to hear from you that, hey, Ken, you finally got the audio stuff figured out. So let's jump to the Todd video and uh, I'll come back right at the end and tell you what's coming up after this. So you shock fish. Yes. Do you, when you get around that Salvania, do you see a lower fish rate than you do in other parts of the world? No, but you know, we're not shocking in areas that are really highly infested, problematic areas of Salvania, just because we can't. It's pretty much the same way that anglers can't utilize it. And I'm talking problematic areas like contiguous two plus acres in size. Mm -hmm. Salvinia mats. I mean, that's when it's problematic. If Salvinia were just to stay as just a fringe back in some of that protective vegetation we talked about earlier where it likes to grow, if it just stayed in there and just kind of be part of the community, it wouldn't be really any kind of big problem. You know, if it just grew in amongst the lily pads and it the like torpedo grass, but you know, once it gets going, it gets out of hand. Yeah. And I don't believe any of us, including the, the vegetation treatment crew, None of us really like spraying herbicides. It's just a necessary evil. It really is. Right. Now, we use uh, biological controls when we can, specifically the, uh, the, the Salvinia weevil. And it shows problems. Well, so they're doing here. a lot of work around cattle. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that's, uh, you know, the crew here, they do a ton of work with the weevil. They do here too? Yes. Okay, didn't know that. But, you know, there's times where uh, the weevil population maybe gets low or they're just not having the desired impact. And, and you know, oftentimes, you know, you need to spray. It's just a, just is what it is. So when you shock, so if I were to name the top five fish catch areas on Rayburn, just off the top of my head, historically, I'd say Beach, Harvey, <clears throat> the canyons, uh, the forest, that'd probably be my top four, I'd say. If you shock in those four areas versus the creeks between Beach and Harvey that nobody fishes in, do you see a big difference in the number of fish? No, and, and here's why. I mean, to your point, you know, I couldn't agree more with those historically good fishing areas. Uh, I think sometimes some anglers lose sight of this. To me, it's just a space issue. I mean, how many acres of lake do you have, say, 15 feet and less? You know, the Black Forest Flats, for example. The farmer's Flat, need more point. Caney Flats. Caney Flats. There's just more room for bass to homestead versus more steeper bank areas. Our electrofishing surveys are bank only. I mean, that, that technique, it's only good to maybe five or six feet in depth. And sometimes if the water's turbid, you can't even see them down that deep. But uh, it, it can stun fish a little bit deeper, but we just can't dip So they don't float up? They, well, 
Sometimes they do. Sometimes it, that, that initial stun well, we'll make them swim to the top and then and then turn over. Sometimes they just immediately stun four or five feet down and just suspend. But it's a shoreline technique. And I can tell you, it's just amazing how uniformly distributed at least the bass on the shoreline are a salmon. You know, it, what it's told me, uh, you know. You've got an advantage. Well, that's what I was just getting ready to get at. <laughs> Some people would, would try to insinuate I do. The only insight that the electrofishing would give you is it's just kind of the gut feeling we all have as anglers anyway. If something looks fishy, there's fish there, habitat-wise. At times, even just barren clay banks for whatever reason. Uh, of course, we do these surveys at night because it is shoreline-based and, it, and it's limited to shallow water. There's just more fish up there at night, typically. And uh, you know these fish at night are, are feeding robust four, five, ten fish schools just on barren clay, just do nothing areas. Because these uh, survey sites are random. Oh, really? It's not me going out there sampling the best areas. They're completely random in nature. We feel like we get a better uh, uh, better insight in the population if we're doing it completely random. The theory is if you're always electrofishing the absolute best sites on the lake, the numbers go crazy. Well, no, the population could maybe drop by 50%. But if you're always sampling the best parts of the lake, you'd never know it. Right. So we may have a site or two on one of the best areas. We may have some of the worst bank you've ever seen for, for, for a bass to hold up that we might be shot. But where there's habitat, there's bass, period. Uniformly distributed. We're all guilty of fishing because somebody else is fishing in that area. It's the old, it's the old sand bass thing. You know, go where there's six other boats. Well, and you know, usually there's a good reason for that. Yeah, that's true. Admittedly, you know, I've been here a little over 20 years. I remember I was hard-headed for the first, well, for the first year or two, you know, I was just trying to get familiar with the overall lake fishing, but then I kind of went on a two or three-year excursion trying to find those places. I mean, there's got to be places people are fishing. That, yeah. or, there's got to be places that have a lot of bass that nobody's fishing. Sure. Well, I think I kind of learned the hard way. You know, you Every know, once in a blue moon, you might boats. be the only one within four miles and catching them, but oftentimes there's reasons why there's no boats in areas. I'm going to bust him out here. Ben, <laughs> ben Matsuba, right? I never see Ben on the lake, and he comes in with 31 pounds. And so, you know, obviously he's... Yeah, I mean, every once in a while it'll work, but it, let's put it this way, it did not for me. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I've got some shallow stuff up the ashram that scares me to death to run up there. But when I get up there, yeah, I mean, the, up, the upper arm of ash, I mean, you get above, uh, you know, Lane, Lane and Owl Creek, it's just, you know, very little pressure. <laughs> it's just beautiful. And by, like I said, talk about an area that looks fishy. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. All right, so, okay, so uh, a question was, is there, has there been a decline in the population of fish in the past 12, 24 months versus years past? And the answer is? And this is at Toledo Bend. Toledo Bend, yeah, yeah specifically. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we do krill surveys now once every four years, and it's been four years since we've done one. So we're kind of missing that period where, yeah, there, there's you know, a fair number of anglers complaining about the tough fishing there, undoubtedly. So unfortunately, we don't have any current krill or angler catch information. Now, our population surveys out there you know, using the electrofishing boat show very stable numbers. Now, you compare uh, Sam River to Toledo Bend. You know, the Toledo Bend numbers are always really good. But they're about maybe 20% lower than Sam Raper. And, you know, our, our surveys, we hope that they truly reflect the So the that's bass. as a fish per acre or however you want Well, measure. that's what I was getting to. We, uh, we index fish abundance, electrofishing, uh, fish caught per hour of electrofishing. And just intuitively, that should mirror fish per acre. Years and years ago, to get fish per acre, we had to do code rope known surveys. I mean, it's hard to believe in this day and age, biologists like myself would block a, a cove of known size, whether it's 0.8 acres or 2.1 acres, block net it, kill all the fish, there's your estimate of fish per acre. Well, for obvious reasons, we, uh, we don't do that anymore. In fact, I don't think it's been routine in our agency in probably 25 plus years. So it's catch a fish per hour. That's how we index the population. At Toledo Bend, it'll typically be around 130 to 150, and that's really high. I mean, 
it's hard for me to ballpark an average statewide, but again? 130 to 150 total bass collected per hour of pedal time on the shock. Okay, gotcha. I'd ballpark a, a pretty good, decent number. You know, anything probably 80 and above is probably more better than average. So, you know, our samples at Toledo Bend are still really good. Now, you compare them to Sam Rayburn. Rayburn's higher, typically around that uh, 150 to, say, 210 mark. So, looking at those data, yeah, I would say that the, the, the bass population at Toledo Bend is typically around 20% lower in number than it is at Sam Rayburn. That blows my mind. But during this period of time, the last few years, when undoubtedly it seems fishing has gotten tougher, our surveys show the population hasn't changed any. Now, How that, change that gets back to what we talked about earlier between population sampling and the catchability of fish. There's no doubt the uh, decline in submerged vegetation over there, primarily hydrilla, has had an, uh, uh, an obvious impact on the catch rate of fish. Now that, Toledo Bend is, is such an uh, amazing situation to me. It gets back to what we talked about earlier, the, the vastness of the lake. All that heavy timber out in the middle of the basin. I truly believe it's one of the rare cases we have in this day and age where you can really have populations of bass, schools of fish that get out there and are just unmolested, really. And it makes sense to me that maybe that's a lot of what's going on without the hydro. Mm -hmm. You know, the hydrilla decline, um, the catchability goes down, just makes fishing tough. I mean, myself included, I mean, I, I love the fish around the vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the advent of all these top shelf electronics and all the pressure out there. I mean, fish, those fish get caught. I think it alters a behavior at times, and then fish maybe instead of positioning on that hard structure on those points and channel swings and whatnot, uh, oftentimes, maybe these fish start suspending, especially during the summer and, and early fall when fishing typically gets tough for us, you know, June through October. And, and on this note, it, it's kind of a good segue. We're going to kick off some really interesting research, and it's right at this point. It's a unique project that's really, the, the outcome of it is angling success-based. Okay. At Toledo Bend, we're going to uh, do some telemetry work tag uh, with uh, telemetry tags around 50 or 60 adult bass. We're going to try to get uh, a proportionate number of fish, let's say, under three pounds, fish three to five pounds, and fish five pounds and up, and look at exactly what do these fish do. Monthly, seasonally, uh, hopefully going to... This will be radio transmitter? Yes. Okay. We're going to do it for two years. Wow. When's that kick off? It's going to kick off late this fall. And, then when, so we'll and see it gets results. to what we're exactly talking about. I mean, I've spent numerous 12-hour days over there, in Rayburn at times, too, idling around out there in 15 to 30 feet and never mark a school of fish, drop the trolling motor on. Where are they going? That's what we're going to, to dig into. And it's going to be a really cool deal. That, that would be fascinating. You know, what? what uh, there's really been, well, no work that I know of telemetry work on adult bass on reservoirs large enough where these fish can truly get away from you and I as anglers. Why? Because it's just so dang hard to do. Because they can get away from us with the uh, antenna trying to find them. But uh, doing it for, for two years is going to give us an opportunity that if some of these fish we tag in housing, we go through the summer and just can't find them, well, that likely tells us, well, one, maybe they're harvested. We hope that doesn't happen. But two, we're going to know they're, they've left house. Following through through a couple of spring periods, intuitively, we expect them to come back if, in fact, they went out to that main lake. Right. It gives you an opportunity to intercept them in a different cycles. Right. Yeah. I mean, this research is solely because of, of the angler complaints about the, you know, the, the catchability of the fish. And, I mean, it had me concerned as a biologist, no doubt. Now, it was nice to see when so much of the population moved to the bank in the spring, you know, January, February, March, April, they caught them again. 30 pounds. That's right. But here we go again. I mean, it's uh, Toledo Bend is just a, a tough nut to crack sometimes during that June through October period just because those fish have so many areas, especially the more up lake you get, especially Pendleton Bridge North, the whole basin's at play, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, it absolutely. really is. When you think about nature of, of threadfin shad, I mean, they're just pelagic open water fish. 
and, and those, you know, a lot of those bass up to about three pounds or so, I would tell you that, I mean, that's what they're feeding on. You can see me smiling because I'm pretty sure pelagic means they just roam. Pelagic means not <laughs> concerned about habitat. Okay. Open water species, okay. striped bass, white bass, threadfin shad, blue catfish. What is What do you call a fish that is concerned about it? Uh, littoral. Okay. Littoral has shallow water, water habitat. Here. Okay. So you have also done a study on released fish. Well, have I done a study? No. What I did do, for my own curiosity, and as well as the, the, the benefit of, 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 of those that, that read the news releases, I summarized all of the studies that have been done okay. on tournament releases. What would you find? Okay, so that's pretty cool. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what they discovered tracking fish in Toledo Bend, where they go, why they disappear. I meant to ask Todd, what a guy should do. And maybe Todd, if you're watching this, you could post this below. If uh, a guy actually catches one of those fish and, and when they go and they, and they keep the fish, they harvest the fish and it's got a transmitter in it, I suspect there's some cost in those. So uh, if, if we want those back, Todd, if you get a chance, if you guys could post below what guys can do to get those transmitters back to y'all, that'd probably be a good idea because I suspect some of those fish are gonna get harvested. So uh, video five is gonna start with Todd talking about Sorry, my battery died. Uh, I had to get another battery. Uh, so episode five, he's going to start out talking about, he did a, a review of uh, all the studies, I think that he could find, that talked about what happened when fish get released uh, at tournament sites, how, what those fish do. Do they go home? Do they stay there? Do some of them go home. How long does it take them to get home? So we'll start video five with that. I'm really pleased to report, by the way, uh, I just looked, and we have uh, about 50 more minutes of video, so I think there's at least four good solid videos still in here. A lot more where Todd answers y'all's questions, so I think this will be pretty good. I'm sorry about the team barking in the background. Apparently something's happened at the front door. I bet it's an Amazon delivery because I get 100 of those a week. Anyway, uh, so there you go. Episode 5, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing at all. As always, if you don't subscribe, please do. If those little uh, things showed up right there, by the way, let's put one right there. So that little eye, that'll be a link to uh, my, uh, my lake reports here at Sam Rayburn. So you can go on there. If that link didn't show up, that's because you're either not watching it on a device that allows that or you're not watching it on YouTube. So you can go to my website kensmithfishing.com go to the videos tab and watch them there which that's based at youtube so you can see those links those links uh also don't don't forget uh, i've got a facebook page uh please friend me on facebook ken smith fishing uh or uh, i've also got an instagram uh account as well so thanks for tuning in and we will see you guys again uh, i'll get video six up pretty quick or excuse me video five up pretty quick or six whichever is the next one i'm losing count the next video will be up pretty quick uh thanks guys